Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Personas, and this is a video manual for Studio One's Pro EQ2 plugin. If you're new to Studio One, or maybe new to recording and mixing music at all, an equalizer is one of your most important tools, especially once you're done recording and it comes time to mix. Mixing is about setting levels and adjusting the sound of what we recorded to make it sound its best for the mix. EQ is one of those tools that is indispensable when it comes time to mix, and Pro EQ is one of the best. So I'm gonna grab Pro EQ. If you haven't seen it before, if you press F7 when you're sitting here in Studio One, I can press F3 to pull up the mixer that shows me all the faders, and this section up here is where all my plugins or inserts go, including Pro EQ. How do I find it? The easiest way is to press F7, and to make sure we're looking at the effects tab up here, and then just scroll down until you see Pro EQ. I have mine in alphabetical order, so it makes it easy to find. Here's Pro EQ, I'm gonna drag it onto a track, and it pops up. So here's what Pro EQ looks like. There's a lot of buttons and knobs, but it's fairly simple, and I'm gonna walk you through every step. All right, the first thing you'll notice is you've got some different types of meters, different types of information on the screen that tells me there's audio here. On the left here, we have an input meter. This is showing me how loud the signal is coming into Pro EQ. And over here, we've got an output meter. So input and output. Right now, they're the same because the EQ isn't doing anything. But if I were to take the low frequencies and boost them a whole lot, you'd notice this output volume is now louder than this input volume. Let's make it really obvious. Okay, so this is kind of helpful if you want to know, okay, have I, have I affected the volume of this? Is the volume of the output way lower than the input? Okay, maybe I want to increase the overall volume of the EQ to make them be more the same. That's a good rule of thumb when it comes to mixing. If you ever get to the point where you've completely jacked things up and you've moved things around and you don't know what goes where, that is totally fine. I encourage you to just goof around with it. Um, but when it gets to looking like this and you think you've just messed everything up, just come up here to this little uh, menu here. This is where you can find all your presets and just choose default and it'll go back to its default setting. So this is my default. Um, I like this setting a lot. You can take a screenshot of this and make it match what you're doing. So let's just start here at the top and see what these buttons do. So band controls, this just shows and hides all the knobs down here. A lot of times when I'm working with Pro EQ, I might just use these and just move them around and not even see the knobs. I tend to go like this because it's not like I it saves that much real estate, screen real estate. Um, and I do like to be able to come down here and make some adjustments. So I usually leave it open, but that's an option for you if you're trying to just cram a lot of things on the screen. Level range, okay? This is, says 6, 12, and 24 dB. That means if you look over here on the left, just next to the input meter, we see these dB. It stands for decibel, it means volume. Zero is in the middle, and as you go up, it's a positive number. As you go down, it's a negative number. That means this is like, for example, this frequency right here. It's around 193 hertz. As I push it up right here, I've pushed it up by six, six decibels. And as I go up more, the most I can go is 24 dB up. We can see that because this says 24. We can also see that because this gain knob for this particular band of the EQ says 24. So all we're saying here is how much can we turn things up and down? Um, you can go as low as six dB, which really just limits what you see on the screen. You can still boost and cut it. I misspoke a second ago. I can still boost it by 24, but what's on the screen is only six decibels. And then if we go to 12, we're just kind of calibrating what it looks like visually. Um, I would encourage you to just pick one and stick with it because you know this boost, I know what this amount of boost sounds like, but I'm usually using the 24 decibel version. So when I boost like this, that's like a big, huge boost. Um, 12 might make more sense because then even though you move it a long way, it's not a ton of decibels in volume, but I, I typically stick with 24, pick what works for you. Curves, mm, curves, what, uh, okay, curves, <laughs> I don't know what it did for a second. Curves allows you to see kind of the EQ curve of what you're doing. So as I move these around, you see how now instead of just one white line, there's a couple of extra lines here. If I turn that off, those curves go away. So it's kind of showing me the net result of what I'm doing. So if I were to take, let's say, we put these two EQs in the exact same spot, and I boosted one a little bit, and then I cut the other, the net result is probably not much difference in sound, right? So the white line gives us the 
the net result of what we're doing with EQ, but then these other colored lines give us what that particular curve is doing by itself. So if we were to turn this one off by clicking on it, we'll see the white line jumps up here. If we turn this one off, everything's in the center. If we turn this one, uh, this one on, we'll see now it curves down. So it's kind of a yeah, it's just a visual thing. Some people might think it looks kind of cluttered and confusing. Others might, you might find that helpful. This is what this EQ is doing. This is what this EQ is doing. And this white line is kind of what's actually happening to the sound. Um, I usually have this off, I think just for visual cleanliness, if that makes sense. Um, but it might be a cool learning tool for you. All right, let's go back to default just to clear things up. And then here, this is a pull down menu that lets us talk about what we see here in the middle. So all these volumes you just saw, in the middle, this is a spectrum analyzer. Um, you can see down here along the bottom, we have different frequencies. Down here is 50 hertz, this is the low end, this is 10K and up. These are the, that's the outer range, the kind of the full range of human hearing. And how we see this, how we visualize this, there's a couple of options. Third octave means every vertical bar is approximately one third of an octave, okay? And 12th octave just divides it up into twelfths instead of thirds, so one twelfth of an octave. What's cool about this, this actually came out in version 5, I believe. We added this keyboard down here at the bottom that corresponds to the actual notes on the piano. So this song is probably, if I had to guess, in E maybe, because I'm seeing a lot of bumps right here at E. I should know it's my song. Yeah, I think it's an E. Um, but we're seeing other bumps there. So if you have like a particular bass note that's jumping out and you're trying to decide where to go, like right there, I bet I just played an F sharp chord because that little note right there is jumping up. It's helpful. I wouldn't go too nuts on knowing where the notes are, but it's nice to have. FFT curve, this is kind of an average curve. This looks maybe a little more familiar. You can see kind of generally what's happening in real time in the frequencies. And then waterfall looks cool and maybe this is the way you think. It kind of gets brighter with the more energy, sort of. Looks almost like an ultrasound. Um, I'm sure it's helpful, and it gives you kind of a history of what the sound is doing, but I tend to stick to something like third octave. Um, I always recommend, folks, if you find yourself always mixing, making your adjustments based on what you see, you're doing like whack-a-mole. Oh, look, that frequency went up. I'm going to pull it down. Oh, look, that frequency went up. Oh, look, that one jumped up. I'm going to turn it down. You're probably going to get results that don't sound very good. So maybe for you, you turn this off. So you can't actually see the results of what you're doing. You just hear it. So this EQ still works. It's still doing its job. It's just not, you're not seeing the visual changes happen in the spectrum analyzer, if that makes sense. But we'll turn it back on because we want to have some fun here. Okay, next, there's this snowflake button. This has to do with side chaining. By the way, in Studio One, if you just hover your mouse over just about anything, it'll tell you something. So here I'm hovering over this, and it says spectrum, side chain, spectrum, peak, hold. So side chain is a little bit beyond what I want to talk about here, but just about every plugin in Studio One has the ability to side chain, which means I'm going to let another track feed this track and trigger what's happening. I'm not sure why or when I would use it with EQ, to be honest. So we're not going to worry about that setting. High quality, low quality. If your computer, the EQ, Pro EQ is a pretty low, low intensity, low processor um, device. It doesn't take up a lot of, you could put one on every channel and probably not see any issues processing wise. But if you have an older computer or not enough RAM or I don't know, any number of things, you may find that it's performing it's getting bogged down. If that's the case, you can turn down, turn off the high quality mode. Um, I always leave high quality on because I don't see my performance meter down here choking out, um, at least not from EQ. So I, I tend to leave that on. Um, I've not really done lots of testing of how it sounds, but it's there to kind of go with the Pro EQ light version if you need that for whatever computer processor you're running. All right, so that is our kind of the top half this section of the EQ. Now each down here, this may look like a whole lot of knobs, but it's actually pretty simple. We've got low cut filters here. We've got an output gain here. We've got a high cut filter here. And then all of these are basically each one is a band of our EQ. So this is a five band EQ, meaning I have five different knobs that I can boost and cut along the way. So as you see me boosting and cutting, you'll see the frequency and the gain of each of these changes as well. And they're color coordinated, which is nice. So I can say, okay, the, the orange one is this one. Now I can still move this one wherever I want, um, but you'll still know the orange one is, is connected to this particular knob here. A um, couple of things about EQ. Um, most EQs 
use, uh, not most, but a lot of EQs have the ability to boost and cut, right? We talked about that. The ability to choose the frequency, which is left and right, and also the ability to adjust the width of the cut. So as you can see, this is a very narrow cut, right? We're just boosting a very, or cutting a very narrow set of frequencies. This is very wide. That's called the Q control. I think it stands for quality. It's a part of some formula. But basically, the higher this number, the narrower it gets. The lower the number, the wider it gets, okay? Um, beyond this video to tell you when to use which, but if I have a particular, as an example, a vocal that has a whistly sound, kind of a harsh sound, I'll go find that frequency up here and do a cut like that with a very narrow, it's called a notch filter. Um, but each of these bands has the ability to adjust up, down, left, right, and width. Now, cool trick here, you can do this by moving the knobs up and down, just click and drag on each of these knobs, or you can click and drag on the actual little button itself. So I can bring this up, right, left, just by clicking and dragging, and if I want to adjust the width, I just hover over it, I don't click and I just scroll with the scroll wheel. And you'll see it's adjusting the width here without me having to turn any of these knobs. So if you've watched any of my videos or if you watch some in the future, you see me move this and then it get wider and narrower almost magically. That's what I'm doing. I'm just scrolling the mouse wheel. I probably should mention that I'm doing that more often, but here you go, it's here in this video. And then finally, we can just turn that on and off. So we can turn the entire, every plugin in Studio One can be turned on and off by clicking on this activate button kind of a power button. You can see it's here and it's also located here on the plugin in the mixer as, as well. But we can also activate and deactivate individual bands of EQ. Two ways to do that, we can click on the button here that turns it on and off, or we can double click on the, actually just single click on the nodule itself. So I can turn these off like this. So you really could operate this EQ pretty effectively without even seeing the controls. I still like the controls because I like to know kind of what exact frequency I'm at, things like that. So those things I just showed you, the gain, the frequency, so up, down, left, right, and width, those are similar to all five of these bands. So once you understand that, you understand all of these knobs here. The other thing that's, the one thing that's different is the low frequency and the high frequency have this pull down for them. Peaking is the normal mode that I default to. Um, if, you're, if you're new to Studio One, yours might default to something like a shelf. So a shelf is basically an EQ that, like this one, it turns up frequencies and then just turns up everything to the right. So everything at 3.4K and up gets boosted. So it looks literally looks like a shelf. Um, very handy for certain situations, both for boosting and cutting. And you typically see this in the highest and the lowest bands of an EQ. With uh, Pro EQ 2, we have the option. We can have it be a regular peaking, what we call a parametric EQ that just does just like all the other ones. It has boost and cut. It has, it's kind of a hill that goes down on both sides. Or if we want a shelf, we can set that here and we can do the same for the low frequencies as well. Okay, now you'll see this one looks different from this one. What's going on there? Well, the width control controls the shape of that filter. Okay, so if we go really high, it has this kind of both narrow boost and cut right around the cutoff frequency. Um, and if we go lower, we get a much smoother um, shelf out of it. I tend to like the smoother ones. They sound more natural to me. Uh, you may be wondering, what is with this 6 dB, 12 dB, and 24 dB? That's not talking about volume. That's actually talking about, it's called the pole. Um, it's the, the what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's how many dB per octave um, it takes for the shelf to kind of come into full effect. So if I go with a shelf of, let's go back to default. Everything's getting kind of messy. If I use my low frequency with a shelf of 6 dB, and I do a boost, you'll see it eventually gets to a, just a flat, flat boost, right? Equal. But you'll notice it's a very slow and gradual slope. It takes several, if we look at the, uh, if each three of these is an octave, you can see it takes several octaves from when it starts up here to when it finally reaches its kind of max frequency or max volume, it does it very slowly. So it's a very smooth and slow boost. It's not abrupt, it's slowly boosting as we go further to the left. If I adjust this to something like a 24 decibel shelf, you can see it's just a lot sharper. Um, that's a lot more useful if I need to hear these frequencies, but I need to cut everything below it, for example. That's an example of a higher one. I tend to go with the middle one. I feel like the 6 dB is a little too subtle. The 12 seems to work well for me. Um, it's not too aggressive, but it's not too subtle either. The idea here is the sharper this filter is here, 
the more it can add some artifacts to the sound. It's just the nature of how filters work in the real world, like with an analog EQ. So the digital version does the same. So I tend, tend to go with a 12 and sometimes a 6 if I want it to be real subtle. Okay? Same thing with the high frequency has the same exact options. All right, cool. I know this is a lot, but once you learn how all this works and you use it for a few weeks, all of this will become like riding a bike, second nature. You may not use some of these features ever. Like for example, the shelf, I rarely use. I'm usually working it like this, um, but we have a few more things to go over and we'll be done. All right, over here on the left-hand side, this bottom left and bottom right, these are our low cut and high cut filters. You'll also hear these referred to as a high pass and low pass filters. It's weird terminology. The low cut does this, it cuts the lows but it's also known as a high pass filter because it lets the high frequencies pass. I know, it's kind of weird. Um, and then the high cut does the same thing in the other direction. So it's a low pass, it's cutting the highs. You'll see this dB per octave. Okay, I misspoke earlier. The shelf here is, I think, just... I'm not exactly sure what the numbers mean on the shelf. I misspoke. It has to do with how quickly it gets to the max volume. Um, I don't know exactly what it means. The dB per octave known as pole for some reason, that has to do with these filters here. So this is just how steep the filter is. So similar explanation as before, the 6 dB per octave is a lot more smooth and gradual. And as we go higher, we can go as high as 48. That is a straight like cliff. So you go here, and as you get lower in frequency, then the volume just drops off entirely. I tend to like the 12. Again, it's a kind of a natural middle of the road version. But if I've got something where there's a really loud on a vocal from a live recording, and I gotta get that cut, but I don't wanna cut all these other frequencies just above it, I'll do something like this, and then I'll just put it in the exact spot where it cuts the, the boom that's happening, but leaves everything else intact. The trade-off there, like I said before, is it sounds a little more unnatural when it's such a sharp curve, but it's there because sometimes that's just what you need. Same thing on the high frequencies. Final section here is this LLC that does not stand for Limited Liability Corporation. It stands for a linear low cut. So this is something we added in version 5. In addition to this low cut, which has a completely uh, completely variable EQ or frequency setting, we can go from 20 hertz all the way up to 20k, depending on our situation. This one has a couple of preset frequencies. So when I turn this on, I can choose between 80, 50, and 20 hertz. And if we go up to 80, we can see it's pretty sharp and I can switch it to soft. This is the exact same functionality as the low cut filter here, but this is called a linear phase low cut. You don't have to memorize that. Remember, just hover your mouse over it and it'll tell you. This is a phase linear, I said it backwards, low cut filter, okay? And active just means that it's turned on. So filters, I mentioned before that they can sound unnatural. One of the things they sometimes do is they increase, they create a phase shift where certain frequencies get out of phase with others. And that the end result is it can maybe make it cause some smearing, cause it to not sound quite as clear in those low frequencies once they start being turned down, okay? This linear cut low, this, <laughs> this phase linear low cut, that's a mouthful, um, it doesn't have that. It has extra processing in an algorithm that prevents each, that keeps each frequency in phase with the ones next to it so that it provides a smoother, more natural response. Because this is heavier on processing, we don't give you tons of options, we give you three. 20 hertz, which just grabs the lowest of frequencies, 50 hertz, and 80 hertz. And then the soft button allows you to go between pretty sharp cutoff, like that higher dB per octave setting, and then something that's a little smoother. I tend to only use this on like my main mix bus or in mastering. Otherwise, I tend to still use this one. Um, but if you get to a point where you're curious, go f like set both of these up in a very similar place and just compare the difference. So we'll set this one to... 80, click this one on 80 and just flip back and forth and pay attention and see if one sounds better to you than the other. Might be interesting to do. And the final piece of the Pro EQ puzzle is this little section here. This has to do with the output volume. As we do our EQ moves, we might be increasing the overall volume of the track quite a bit. This allows us to make up for that or to correct that increase in volume by turning the overall output volume of the EQ down. The idea here is if I turn this EQ on and off, I typically like for it to be roughly the same volume with or without EQ. This 
output gain knob allows us to do that. Some EQs don't have it, and it's, it's really handy to have. Also, there's an auto button that will essentially do that for you. You'll notice when you turn on the auto button, you can no longer turn the gain knob because it's doing it internally. So you'll notice this output volume is a lot quieter than it was before uh, because it's actually automatically trying to compensate for all these boosts in volume. Same with cuts. If we remove a lot of frequencies with cuts, it's going to kind of boost the output to make sure it's roughly the same as the input. Now, that doesn't always work perfectly because if I do a lot of boosting or cutting of the lows, then it's going to increase the overall volume of the whole track, which is going to make the highs louder. So it almost ends up sounding like a boost. So I tend to leave this auto setting off for the most part and do this manually, but it can be helpful, especially if you're learning frequencies and you want to do a lot of this where you're sweeping around like this uh, right here. And you want to hear what those different frequencies sound like without causing a huge bump in volume, that auto button can be really handy for that. Okay, so those are all the settings inside of Pro EQ. There's one other thing you should know. Um, you may have certain frequencies that you like. So my default settings look like this. If you zoom in here, um, you'll see I like my high frequency at 8K, my high mid at 2K, low mid at 200, mid at 500, and low at 50, okay? That's not what the default default settings are in Studio One, but that's what I wanted. So I moved them all exactly where I want them. You can do that by just typing the frequency in. For some reason, my keyboard is not working right now. I must have hit a button. You can type those frequencies in, hit enter. And then when you've got it like you want it, come up here to this menu, and actually not the preset menu, but this little drop down here, if you click on that, you can say store preset, you can name it whatever you want, or you can store this as the default preset. And this will override the existing default. Now, every time you open Pro EQ in a session, this, these will be the default settings. That includes your uh, third octave settings or whichever metering you want, um, which, you know, how steep these filters are, all those things can be saved as your default preset. So you're starting from the same point every time you work. All right, that's it for me. Hope this was helpful for you. I know this is not a super exciting video, but it's the kind of thing if you're just getting started or you've never really figured out what all these knobs and buttons do inside of Pro EQ, now you know. File this one away, refer back to it if you get stuck in the future, and uh, we'll have a lot more videos like this on the channel. Thanks so much for being a Studio One user. I'll see you in the next one.